go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your uh, dog life journey. I am Michael Vernio of Integra Kennels. Uh, I run that kennel along with my wife and partner, Kelly Vernio. Um, I started in dogs as a young man. My grandma had a German Shepherd that I absolutely loved. And from there, I just kind of gravitated toward dogs. I've owned Pitbull, Rottweil, and Zakitas, Charles, Connie Corsel, Bull Mastiffs, uh, Pressers, and uh, various mixes. I got into what people call band dogs, but I like to call hybrid Mastiffs. As a result of studying John Swinford, and I did a lot of research and fell in love with this so-called breed. And I just kind of incorporated different stock into my own program. Now, currently, we are using English Mastiff, Press Canario, and Great Dane. The reason being is that English Mastiffs are the forerunner of Guardians, in my opinion. But due to the influx and in show people, though they've lost their function. And we took that English Mastiff. What I love is that Guardian type instinct that's natural. And I went with that, but I wanted that attitude, if you will, in a much more um, mobile package. So with Dane being the tall, elegant breed that it is and extremely athletic, we went that route and created what we call a Master Dane. A lot of people call him Danis, but we prefer the term Master Dane because our line favors more the Mastiff side, being heavier, thicker. But they do carry a great deal of Dane features. The muzzle is longer, and they are taller and somewhat lankier. For me, it's like a perfect combination where you get that athletic ability with that natural protective instinct. And then finally, we added Preston Canario, which is regarded by many people, not all, but many people, regarded as the forerunner of Guardian Breeds today. So, when you add that along with what we already had, I think it works, it comes together nicely into a pretty great package. I, so far, I've been very pleased with what we've produced. You know, they're, they're, they're show and drive really early. They are um, big, as to be expected. They have extreme drive like when you open their whelping door at five six weeks they're barking you know and it's not a playful bark it's a defensive bark you know anything you put near them they grab hold to it it's like a pack of land sharks or piranha I call them land piranhas <laughs> <laughs> they are but we're very pleased you know our, our females are very high prey extremely high prey and they are passing that on to their um, offspring. And what I'm seeing is that many people that have come and joined our family, as I call it, they have given us great feedback. You know, one guy says, I'm going to use this pup for, you know, duck hunting. And I'm like, wow, you know, that'd be a first. <laughs> it'd be a first for me, but I am extremely excited to see how well that's going for him so I'm just you know I'm really 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 hands on and excited about this program and what we're doing okay my, my, my first love with these dogs I don't know it's almost spiritual with me and them when I was a kid I used to read a lot of books and most of them were dogs I honestly don't know where or how it comes because Outside of myself and my grandmother, really no one in our family was really big dog people. But it just, it, there's some spiritual connection with me and them where literally there's never been a dog that I haven't liked. There's never been one I haven't loved. And, you know, that's from childhood. I think I bonded with them. You know, maybe we just felt each other's pain or whatever. But there's something about animals, all animals, but especially dogs, that just draws me to them. And, you know, it, it carried throughout childhood, throughout my adulthood. And then I ran into, as I said, I started reading up on Swinford and studying his program. And I met a guy by the name of Andrew, 
original Giannis. He runs Triple X Band Dog Kennels. And he created his line of band dogs, which is the American Borqua Mastiff. He has been a mentor, guide, and brother to me. And I follow his program, and he gave me his blessing to do so. And I kind of mold my image in his own, which he is a and a meticulous, almost obsessive individual about gene mapping and traits lining up. And that, that he's instilled that in me for years, and that's kind of where I go with it. I follow his blueprint and say, you know what? Okay, these dogs will go. There's a lot of experiment, hit or miss. Hopefully you hit more than you miss. <laughs> or at least go 50-50. But, um, you know, we go and kind of just kind of toss it up. Like with the Master Dan experiment, that's exactly what it was. And it just happened to work out. It just happened to work out perfectly where everything lined up ideally and when we incorporate the press canario into it again it was another experiment that worked and it, it's like i went over with him for hours and hours and hours and hours of reading mapping up traits how they would line up this dog but you know right down to colors you know how we would get you know, uh, how we would get what brings, you know, what traits, what paw size, what head size, how much space between your eyes and ears, uh, the temperaments. You know, if we got a bred two really, really, really aggressive dogs, what, how would that come out? Should we breed a less aggressive female to a, calmer, a more aggressive male, vice versa? You know, all these things we've done like what breeds down to you know if you go with this breed and these pups come out so hot as we like to say do we take it to this breed to kind of calm it down and balance it out it's been a long 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 journey but andrew has guided me and i definitely wouldn't be where he, i am today without his guidance you know along with my wife she was not a dog person either but she has gotten into it to where she studies dog foods to see what, <laughs> what dogs, what ingredients are best for those dogs, what foods go best for them while they're growing. It's been a, a, a total family endeavor, and we've all kind of immersed ourselves in it wholeheartedly, head first, <laughs> deep in, no shallow water. Uh, structurally, I want sound dogs. Uh, I, of course, um, size wise, I myself being six foot four and 220 pounds, I like bigger dogs. And there is kind of a, a market for people that like those bigger dogs. So that's kind of what my aim is. Temperament wise, I want, you know, great family guardians, excellent companions. You know, I want them to be where we're breeding. My breeding program is more focused on temperament and size. You know, I want 150, 130 plus pound dogs. Um, I want those dogs to be able to move, which is why we went with the athleticism of the Great Dane. Um, color wise, I prefer myself darker dogs because as guardians, you know, most criminals do their, their handiwork at night. And if you miss this dog, this black dog that, you know, you're trying to break into my house and you miss him, and here's this 175-pound dog that you missed that gives us the upper hand. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I what I want. You know, I don't I don't like barkers. You know, so my dogs tend to, if they're barking, I, I we go and look, not just me. We go and look because they don't just bark at anything. There's something there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is what we want. We want them to be versatile to where... Like, I have a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a seven-year-old. They can ride my dog's backs. But in the same token, those same dogs that my kids can ride will defend those same children to the death. You know, they will absolutely defend them without hesitation. And that is where I take my most pride. You know, I take my most pride in knowing that 
a family that has one of our dogs is well protected. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they'll say, oh, this, that dog is so big. Oh, he's so pretty. Oh, that's a stunning dog. Yes, that's all well and fine, but this stunning dog will also defend you. You know, there's a lot of people that say, oh, well, I want AKC. I want show lines. I want this. And I say to them, I had a person the other day said it to me, and I said, well, you know, you go get a working dog from the AKC, and he's got all the ribbons in the world. But that dog sits right there. Why should somebody go take him off the wall? You know, my dogs don't have any AKC, as they say, championship paperwork. But come in my house, and you won't leave the same way you came. And I pride myself in that. You know, I've had one of my clients say to me, man, this puppy is only 13 weeks old. And already, he's getting in front of my two-year-old and barking at people that come near him. That's where I take my pleasure. That's where we get joy. Because we know, without a shadow of a doubt, that this dog and that family are a perfect match. And they are going to be matched up for the next 10 to 12 years, if not longer. Offspring are a quarter, 25% of English Mastiff and Dane, and 50% Press Canario. But I'm also running a purebred line of Press Canarios, just as, you know, added benefit so I, I because I'm really I'm really really into the press of Canario they have really really great traits for me and they don't get as big as my hybrids but they are still you know the prey drive is still there the, the protection and defense is ingrained and they're just gorgeous dogs they're just gorgeous and when we breed the pure press of Canarios we get a lot more brindles which is a coat color that I'm very, very fond of, as opposed to the solid blacks, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, that, that brindling, for me, it's just a, a, a personal trait, a choice that I like or love. And it's, it's like, I'm always into that. So when I go with those, you know, I get a more compact foot, cat-like foot, and they're, they're extremely thick, whereas the hybrids, they are thick, but not as thick. You know, the hybrids are taller. But the purebreds are just muscle, solid muscle. And I love them for that. Mm-hmm. You know, but the, the dogs, all of them, are just absolutely gorgeous to me. And they do what we ask of them. You know, the intelligence for me is crazy. You know, it's absolutely crazy. You know, sometimes these dogs, if you're not watching them, they will outthink you or try to. You know, I've had my, my press of females unlock their gates on their kennels. I've had, <laughs> I've had them reach through the kennels to the other kennel to slide a tray of food over so they can steal it and tip it over. You know, it's, it's funny to me. But they're very, very intelligent dogs. And that's what at times frustrates you, but it also makes you proud because it's like, okay, this dog has natural intelligence and I've harnessed that. So it's like, all right, you know, and you just get so proud when, when one of my clients calls and says, man, this dog is so smart. I taught it to sit already and come and do this and do that. I get so excited because I'm like, yes, you <laughs> know, you know, for me, there's there's a lot of guys that are saying that are big pit guys, and I'm all for the pit bull. You know, but I say to people, I get a presser, I get that same, I get that same gameness and grit in a bigger package mm-hmm. that will bring down a man willingly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, why wouldn't I take that over the pit? You know. <laughs> yeah. And I get a lot of flack for it, but, you know, hey, it's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. Ironically, with them being short-coated, they don't want to come in during the winter. You know, last winter, it, we had a week straight of minus 50 and below. Mm-hmm. And I had to fight my dogs to make them come in. You know, a little known fact is that English Mastiffs actually love cold weather. Even though they're shorter coated, mm-hmm. they love. It. And 
you know, they just, they all stay out and I, you know, they, they play in the snow when you let them out and they're running in the snow. You got to call them back 10 to 20 times because they just absolutely love it. You know, now conversely, the heat, they're not fans of. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they will mostly lie in their kennels. Yeah. You know, and I'll spray them down every so often with the holes and keep them cool. Or most times I'll even bring them in. You know, when it gets 87 with high, high humidity, I'll bring them in. Right. You know, I don't like being out of that, so I know they help. Yeah. You know, but, you know, during the winter when you think, hey, they want to come in. Nope. Nope, they don't. They They don't. It's like, as long as they got, you know, their water's not frozen, they're fine. And I, I've never, you know, I would have never sought that. But, you know, if their water, you know, that's the thing. You have to constantly worry about their water dishes freezing. So we got heated dishes and all that stuff. And they are absolutely okay with it, which is they are far greater than I am because I hate going out there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I said, we had a week straight and then we had blizzard. We had snow drifts of. 13 feet mm. and they would not come in you know you take them for walks and you know they'll they'll pull my kids on sleds you know <laughs> and just generally enjoy that weather mm-hmm. and i i enjoy them doing that mm-hmm. because it, it saves me from having to go out and <laughs> do it right <laughs> what, what what does your uh, kennel setup look like and and what's the reasoning uh, behind it well, I have I have a five I have the I can't remember the company name, but it's five kennel setup, mm-hmm. indoor outdoor from my garage, and I have that. So each one of them it's six by twenty by ten each kennel, and um, it's that way so they get enough space, you know. And I have roofs over the top of them. They've all got dog glue igloo houses. I set them up that way so that they each get their own space and they don't fight Mm -hmm. because, you know, when females are in heat, they'll fight to the death. Males will fight, et cetera, et cetera. But I have them set up that way and I have dividers in there so they can't be any accidental breeding through the fence. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, you know, like I said, I do that just so they have their own personal space. But then we go out and I leave one to run the enclosed kennel area out at night because we do have pups back there. Mm-hmm. And in case, just in case somebody decides, hey, I'm going to get a wild hair up my butt and maybe try something. You know, well, hello, here's, here's my guard. You know, I'm a firm believer that with my dogs, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'll shoot. I'll do this. You know, a gun will jam. A shooter will miss, but my dog won't do either. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. So, you you know, you hop my fence, do so at your own peril. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, back to the kenneling. Um, we also have inside kennels inside of the garage where they can come in when it does get that hot, that sick and then cold, and you have to force them in, or that hot where you have to force them in. We've got fans inside there to cool them off and then heat it as to warm them. And it also doubles as a whelping box and pen area. Just, you know, keeps everybody honest. You know, keeps them all honest and, you know, separate. And, you know, again, these these are, are independent, very strong-willed and intelligent dogs, and they have to have their own space. Yeah, they're a pack, but they still need their own space, just like we do. You know, we all, we, we're a big family of six children and the two parents, but we still all, we all love each other, but we still all need our individual space. And I feel like the dogs deserve that as well. What kind of diet do you like to feed and, and, and what's the, the reasoning behind that? With us, we, we alternate between raw and high quality kibble, the high quality kibble being wellness core. Um, we use wellness because our dogs look superb on it, and we started on that dog food probably five years ago, and we've had great luck. You know, it, it 
supplements joint and bone and helps all those issues. And the raw is just, it sticks to them better. You know, there's less poop cleanup, which my kids are happy about. <laughs> <laughs> there's less poop. They look better. It gives them, it adds that lean muscle to them. And for me, I believe that the dog is a relative of the wolf, and the wolf doesn't eat dog food in the wild. You know, we give a lot of fruit and berries to our dogs for eye health as well as internal health. You know, it promote you know natural things mm -hmm. because again, in the wild, you don't. There's no kibble there. You know, they're eating a lot of innards and meat and berries and stuff. So that's what we do. You know, I try and keep their diet as close to natural for them as I can. Mm -hmm. But I also, I also believe that there's that's good and quality kibble too. Yeah. I think it's good in that too. You know, there's so many different brands of kibble out there that you almost get lost. You know, so I just kind of, you know, stay with what works for us. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, like you say, this, you have to be so exact with adding in this and adding that. And yeah. it's just, it, for me, it's just, I don't have time. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't have the time to do it with my dogs and my children in everyday life. So I just go back and forth. Yeah. But they do, they get a lot of innards and organs. Yeah. So, you know, they get a lot of that stuff because it 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 adds just a bit of natural, you know, that natural feel for them. Yeah, I believe and these guys they love it. You know, they know it's like they know their their raw days. Right. You know? <laughs> like, oh yeah. Yeah. They're always happy to eat, but when it it's like they know the days that they're supposed to get the raw because they get a little extra oomph. Right. Or right, a little higher pitch to the barks. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, it's a it's a grind, mm -hmm. but it's a labor of love. What is your philosophy behind like health testing and, and, and such? I'm all for health testing. We do it personally, but you know what I was told by my vet. And I'll probably get a lot of flack for saying it, but, you know, he told me that, you know, a lot of people put all this stock in hip testing. The reality is, is that if you've got a dog with great hips or a dog that has bad hips and you breed them, there's still only a 7% chance that the offspring will have bad hips. <laughs> yeah. And not many people know that. Not many people know that, and fewer still will accept that as truth, but this is a veterinarian that told me this, you know, it's a 7% chance, good or bad, if they're bred together, that they'll have bad hips. Mm -hmm. It kind of took me for a loop. Right. But, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we support wholly health testing. We encourage people to do it. We even offer with our dogs a uh, 36 month as opposed to 24 month health guarantee. You know, because we want that, we want to make sure that that dog is absolutely healthy. Mm -hmm. And if for any reason he's not, then you can come back. You know, and we haven't had anyone make a claim yet, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm thankful for that. Every one of our breeds are, t are ugh, excuse me again. Every one of them th that's used is prone to bloat, hip dysplasia, um, eye atropian, entropian, mange, and it's it's about for us staying vigilant mm -hmm. and being super careful when they're younger. Mm -hmm. You know, anytime you're dealing with larger, extra large breeds, you have joint and bone issues. So that's where feeding comes in, you know, and not over-exercising that pup and not letting, you know, everybody wants to run around with their pups. 
you know, and you just can't do it with these bigger dogs. You know, it, 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 it there's such a, a strain on their systems, you know, and everybody wants, you know, oh, I want the biggest dog. The most, the, the most commonly asked question that I get is, how big, how big, how big, you know, and everybody wants to have a six month old 120 pound dog but no one realizes hey that's not healthy for that dog mm -hmm. you have to let allow that dog to grow because his genetics will dictate his diet not what you feed him you know and i, I have to i tell people a lot you know don't overfeed the dog so fast you know because you want him to be 60 pounds and he's two months old you know, that's bad for him. And you'll see that the dogs have bowed legs and cow hocks, as we call them. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I'm so against that. You know, me personally, I tell people, let them grow tall first, then worry about the weight. Mm -hmm. You know, but we all, Americans, I've learned, we all, we all are say we want the biggest dog quickest. You know, my friend's dog is this big. I want my dog to be bigger than that. And that's just not healthy for that dog at all. It's not healthy. And we, we recommend, you know, large breed because it promotes slower growth. And, you know, you give them that raw and things of that nature because you really want these dogs to grow slow. You really do. Mm -hmm. You know, the quicker they grow. Like, for me, what I say to people all the time is that when you get dogs that grow quick, big, quick, they tend to stop growing. Right. You know? <laughs> And I could be wrong, but that's just what I've noticed. Right. You know, when you let them grow, you know, at that slower rate, you, you, I have learned that I get a healthier dog that's far more uh, agile and athletic because there's no, you know, he's got no hip issues. He's not limping. He's not too big to do anything because... You know, like, we have one of our dogs that was sold. He's now 100 and, I think, 68 pounds, something like that, or 178 pounds. But he's only a year old. Wow. You know, and I was very displeased with that. Because, you know, what's left for him? Right. You know, <laughs> he's only going to get bigger. Yeah. You know, and that's not healthy. That, that's not healthy, you know, you don't want, you know, the man isn't supposed to be four and five hundred pounds no. at, at 12 years old. No. You know, so, you know, we, we are big on that stuff. Big. Right. You know, but I don't know, to each his own. You know, it's, it's I can only guide them, but once the dog is theirs, it's theirs, and they're going to do what they want to do with it. Right. I don't know. <laughs> I just try and be decent. Mm -hmm. I try, you know, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So most people, they'll listen, but there's always that one person that knows better than you about <laughs> dogs. Right. And then it's like, you know, you come back and, hey, my dog is messed up. And, <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> Well, you guys gave us a guarantee, and it's like, well, you know what? Hey, a dog is a hundred. The dog's two hundred pounds. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's twenty-two pounds away from two hundred, and it's a year. Yeah. Not healthy at all. Not healthy at all. But you know, you can only lead him to water. Right. <laughs> what are your future goals, basically, with your program? Right now, it's just to maintain the road, the path that we're on, and continue. Hopefully, somewhere down the line, I will possibly add Tulsa into the line. I'm not sure. Because, I mean, the reason behind that would be they are, again, a less barking breed. And it would bring down the barking even more. But that's just something that I'm bouncing around. Is, that's not set in stone. It's not even written on paper yet. But that's just an, an idea. Mm -hmm. um, as far as our vision, we just want to keep putting solid dogs out for people to enjoy and be well protected and defensed. Mm -hmm. You know, 
family guardians. Absolutely. Family guardians. You know, that's why we got into it. That is our main and only focus. Mm-hmm. You know, good family companions and guardians. Awesome.